Hello everyone, good afternoon and a warm welcome to our Construction Law webinar here at Burness Paul. This is the second in a series of three COVID-19 focused webinars to try to assess some of the complex legal issues that the COVID crisis has raised for the construction industry. I'm Fenella Mason and I head up the construction team at Burnett Paul and I'm going to chair the webinar today. Um, I'm joined by two of my partners from the construction team, Gavin Payton and James Forbes. I'm sure they'll both be well known to many, if not most of you. Um, but for those of you who don't know Gavin and James, a brief background. Gavin assists clients with a wide range of building and infrastructure projects across the UK. And the focus of his advice is on procurement strategy, contract drafting and negotiation, as well as contract management issues when projects are on site. As well as mainstream construction projects, um, Gavin's also an expert on projects work and spends a lot of time working on hub initiative projects. Gavin lectures on the construction law master's course at the University of Strathclyde in his spare time. And James advises on all aspects of construction law, ranging from development projects to large capital projects like the 500 million pound M8 extension NPD project. James is dual qualified in Scots and English law and regularly advises on construction projects south of the border as well as this side of the border. Both Gavin and James have been busy over the last three weeks dealing with queries on COVID issues and resultant amendments to contracts and they'll come on and talk to you in a minute or two about what they've been doing. So it's super to see so many of you here on our webinar. I've got a few housekeeping matters to mention. Um, as I said right at the start, can you please ensure your mute button is on so that um, hopefully we're not hearing too many barking dogs. Um, we did automatically mute you when you joined, but if you can just keep checking that you stayed muted, that would be great. Feel free to ask questions through the WebEx chat function. If you could address your questions to me and we will anonymize them um, and I will put your questions to the speakers at the end of the session. The reason for the anonymity is that we are recording the session so that we can distribute it afterwards. Um, hopefully you won't have any queries with our privacy policy, but if you do, um, please have a look on our website, which will tell you about our policy. We don't expect any issues. We've been using um, the WebEx platform very successfully for presentations over the last couple of weeks, but um, WebEx have warned that there may be issues because of the volume of demand. So if there are any technical issues, then we'll end the session and we'll let you know when we're going to reconvene. Um, so just a bit of background before we start the presentation. You'll have seen the changing landscape in the industry over the last two to three weeks because of the crisis. Um, last week in our first webinar, I highlighted the differences in approach between the UK and Scottish governments and that we'd had at that time a letter to the industry from the Secretary of State um, for the UK government saying construction sites stay open at, insofar as you can and work safely and we'd had comments from the First Minister saying her advice was that you should close. The Scottish government followed up with that advice by issuing a guidance doc at the start of this week saying that all sites other than essential uh, construction sites should close um, and they identified construction as a non-essential activity. So uh, obviously issues arising from that and to what, what does that mean in terms of the guidance and advice from the Scottish Government. We have, uh, they identified in that same uh, guidance document critical national infrastructure and listed 13 different types of infrastructure um, where sites could continue to operate but still um, under the required uh, social distancing and only if they could do so safely. This week we've also seen the Scottish Coronavirus Bill become law, not that it has um, any immediate implications for the construction industry. We've seen guidance from various industry bodies. Uh, one that we find most interesting perhaps is the Scottish Futures Trust um, guidance document in relation to operational PPPs. And we've seen a second um, PPN come out of the UK government and we're waiting for a further Scottish PPN to come out. 
So that's the sort of um, legal and regulatory background. On the ground, as it were, we've seen sites close. We've even seen some reopen. We've seen some projects going on hold, others where our clients are trying to conclude deals and tie up their legals ahead of starting works at some point in the future. We have had a very diverse range of inquiries as to the approach to be taken um, to drafting contracts, and we've seen another, a number of different approaches taken to dealing with COVID-specific terms. So that's the background of, of where we are, and against that, Gavin and James um, will give their presentations and hopefully cast some light on issues um, that are of interest to you. So with that, I would hand over to Gavin. Thanks, Gavin. The nation uh, from, a damp, from a damp suburban street uh, in Glasgow. Uh, quite a number of you joined the webinar that we ran last Thursday, uh, which focused on the implications of COVID-19 on projects currently on site under construction contracts entered into prior to the impact of COVID-19 becoming apparent. That session considered the consequences of COVID-19 and how we treated under the unamended SPCC and NEC suite of contracts in terms of extension of time, loss and expense and termination. It highlighted the possible differences in outcome under the SPCC and NEC suite. And a recording of that webinar can be can accessed via our website. This um, slide uh, sets out the agenda uh, for the session today. And in this session, James and I have been set a number of questions that we'll seek to answer based on our experience with the last few tumultuous weeks. My section is focused on construction contracts due to be entered into in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. So why are some contracts being pulled or delayed? There are a whole host of reasons, and I'm sure you'll have your own. Um, the impact of COVID-19 uh, on the construction process, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the property market, the impact of COVID-19 on the economy generally. Uh, some have been pulled or delayed because parties have been unable to agree the allocation of COVID-19 related risks. On others, employers such as public sector bodies are understandably focusing on other more immediate priorities, which means that their capital projects have been put onto the back burner. In other instances, they're simply logistical challenges in having contracts produced, circulated, and signed. In any event, um, why would anyone want to contract in the current environment? Some employers uh, and contractors are still trying to conclude contracts, notwithstanding the very challenging and constantly changing environment. Those challenges include inconsistent UK and Scottish Government advice and guidance with which compliance is not mandatory, restrictive and fluid UK Government and Scottish Government statutory requirements with which compliance is mandatory, moral and societal pressures and the risk of reputational damage regardless of compliance with advice, guidance and statutory requirements, and the impact of all of the above on the availability of labour, services, material and plant. And at a macro level, an enormous amount of uncertainty as to the depth and length of the impact of COVID-19 on the ability to progress and complete construction projects. Given that backdrop, I think we all might ask ourselves why a contractor would enter into a construction contract in that environment, unless they are fully protected contractually against the consequences of COVID-19. However, equally, we might ask ourselves why an employer would enter into a construction contract in this environment if the contract did fully protect the contractor from the consequences of COVID-19, knowing that potentially open-ended claims for extension of time uh, and loss and expense uh, and, and related costs could flow immediately. However, we are seeing some employers and contractors working very hard to agree contractual terms that will allow them to contract and if that's not possible, agreeing a letter of intent and instruction covering design development and or the ordering of long lead items. 
Some employers seem willing to take on COVID-19 related risks, and some contractors seem willing uh, to share with the employer COVID-19 related risks. The motivation for employers to enter into contracts in this environment seems to be to minimise delays to programmes of planned projects. And the motivation for contractors, on the other hand, seems to be to deliver for their clients, maintain turnover, and satisfy their banks that they have a pipeline of work. However, these motivations may well result in contractors taking COVID-19 related risk that they cannot accurately assess and cannot effectively manage. Where construction contracts are being entered into in this current environment, we're seeing a broad range of COVID-19 specific provisions being considered. In some instances, we're seeing COVID-19 specific uh, events being proposed, allowing contractors to claim an extension of time, and in some cases, loss and expense. Those include the exercise of statutory powers by foreign governments related to COVID-19, rather than just the exercise of statutory powers by the UK or Scottish governments, compliance with non-mandatory local, national and foreign government advice and guidance related to COVID-19. Um, if this is included in a contract, the effect in Scotland, because it relates to guidance, will be different from the effect in England, given the significant differences in guidance being issued in the different jurisdictions. In short, the effect of such a provision would be much more far-reaching in Scotland than in England. More generally, the direct and indirect consequences of the outbreak and spread of COVID-19 virus, including the impact on the availability of labour, services, materials and plant. Where the employer and the contractor are looking to share COVID-19 risk on the basis that the COVID-19 specific events only allow a claim for an extension of time and not loss in expense, then the employer may also want to include express wording in the loss and expense clause specifically excluding these COVID-19 specific events. We're seeing provisions being proposed by contractors which also seek to insulate the contractor against fluctuations uh, in the cost of labour, services, materials and plants due to the impact of COVID-19, where there may have been no impact on theoretically on delay at all in terms of progress. There could still be an impact on the fluctuation in the cost of materials, etc. And that's something to bear in mind. As regards change in law, it seems likely that the statutory requirements being imposed by government in response to COVID-19 will change over time. They are fluid, as we've seen. As a consequence, parties contracting now in the midst of the outbreak are considering including COVID-19 specific change in law provisions, clearly allocating the risk of post-contract COVID-19 specific change in law. As regards health and safety, um, although it is fast changing, it's relatively easy to focus on COVID-19 specific advice and guidance and legislation. However, employers and contractors are also having to give consideration to compliance with general duties under health and safety law in a COVID-19 world. In theory, health and safety compliance could require measures that go further than COVID-19 specific guidance and statutory requirements. So parties contracting now also need to consider the potential impact of COVID-19 on the progress and cost of construction projects in terms of compliance with health and safety law, specifically the allocation of risk as regards the cost of any delay and any increase in the cost of completion. As regards termination, some employers and contractors are agreeing a COVID-19 specific no-fault termination provisions. These are generally triggered where the impact of COVID-19 has resulted in the works or a substantial part of the works being suspended for a fixed period of time. The fixed period being agreed will generally be longer than the two-month default position under the SBCC and JCT forms of contract. The rationale being that it is anticipated that the impact of COVID-19 will be longer than two months. Where such COVID-19 specific no-fault termination provisions are being agreed, the employer may want to exclude COVID-19 related events from the employer event of default provisions. For example, where COVID-19 leads to an employer act of prevention resulting in the suspension of the works on site, that suspension 
and that suspension runs for a period that would otherwise have allowed the contractor to terminate the construction contract on an employer default basis. Well, that's excluding that from those events from the employer default termination provisions forces any termination through the no-fault termination provisions. And those no-fault termination provisions have a more neutral uh, impact in terms of the employer's liability for compensation on termination. Insolvency risk is, is also an area parties contracting at the moment need to pay particular attention to. Employers can seek to protect themselves through enhanced performance security. Contractors uh, can seek to protect themselves with employer payment guarantees or escrow arrangements or manage their exposure through a fortnightly valuation and payment cycle. Parties entering into contracts in the current environment should also make sure that the notice provisions in their contracts contain at least one method of serving notices that can be complied with, even if there's a complete lockdown situation, say with no Royal Mail and no couriers, uh, perhaps carrier pigeons uh, or owls in the case of the Harry Potter fans. It's important to keep in mind that whilst the existence and impact of COVID-19 may not have been foreseeable when a construction contract was entered into, say in April last year, the existence and impact of COVID-19 will very clearly be foreseeable in the context of a construction contract entered into here and now. As a consequence, construction contracts containing the same words but entered into at different times may have different outcomes in terms of allocation of risk based on what was foreseeable then and what is foreseeable now. In his part of the session, James will consider the UK and Scottish Government procurement policy notes, which encourage the public sector to agree appropriate amendments to existing contracts to assist with the cash flow of contractors and the supply chain, and to give them relief from the consequences of non-compliance due to the impact of COVID-19. It seems sensible to me for that at least some of the principles to be applied to those public sector contracts in terms of existing contracts being amended, but those same principles should be applied to public centre contracts being entered into mid-pandemic. For some, some practicalities in terms of generating and executing contracts, um, I mentioned that that was one of the logistical challenges that was hitting uh, some contracts in terms of production, circulation and signing particularly on bank-funded projects where strict compliance with legal formalities is generally required. And I suppose the challenges that uh, are being encountered, some are quite simple, um, but still challenging. Uh, for example, obtaining copies of standard form contracts. Um, challenges generating printers and challenges having contracts circulated and signed. I don't intend to consider these issues in detail as they're largely practical and legal rather than commercial. In most instances where we've been consulted, we've been able to find a workable solution, including the use of counterpart signing, electronic signature. So happy to assist with any issues you might be having in that regard. So looking to future, um, what will post-pandemic contracts look like? I think it will be very interesting uh, to see the potentially long-lasting effect that our experience now will have on future contracts uh, in terms of allocation of risk. Uh, as an example, I think we may see contractors uh, going forward seeking specific contractual protection in respect of future epidemics and pandemics and their knock-on effects. Could we also see a push by contractors for a right to claim loss and expense, and not just extension of time, arising from delays caused by the exercise of statutory powers and force majeure more generally, on the basis that the next market-busting event could be something completely different. Well, that ends my uh, thoughts for this session. I'll now hand over to my partner, James Forbes. Thanks so much, Gavin, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for listening. We could uh, move on to the next slide, Gavin, that would be great. Um, 
as Vanella said, um, there are a number of uh, guidance notes produced by the UK government, the Scottish government, the Scottish Futures Trust and trade bodies, and uh, you'd be forgiven for thinking they were quite confusing at the moment. Um, given the time of constraints of this seminar, it's not possible for me to provide you with a lengthy analysis of each. I thought I'd give you a few highlights today and encourage you to read our excellent website logs for a more detailed commentary on each of these guidance notes. The first guidance note is the UK government's PPN 220, and it calls on contracting authorities defined as central government departments, executive agencies, non-departmental public bodies, local authorities, NHS bodies, and the wider public sector, excluding the devolved administrations, to do a number of things. And the areas are to pay as normal to the extent they can do, instigate measures to support supply of cash flow and fast payments, and where possible grant relief from a failure to achieve KPIs and relief from service credits or deductions. The second guidance is um, the Scottish Government's equivalent to the PPN 220, the SPPN 520. Uh, and as you would expect, it's very similar to the PPN. But the key differences are it's got a narrower application of notice to the public bodies. It's principally aimed at service contracts, but the principles equally apply to works contracts. And it grants or encourages temporary relief from the Scottish Public Finance Manual's restriction on payments in advance of need to allow such payments to be made up to a value of 25% of the contract sum. The third guidance on the slide is a very useful checklist uh, produced by the Construction Leadership Council aimed at managing a controlled shutdown of sites and facilities where works have been suspended due to COVID-19. Finally, in this slide, uh, the UK government has produced some further guidance in relation to their PPN 220. Now, Phil has mentioned that, and in table form, it sets out possible relief options, uh, such as accelerated payment, certification for payment where actual work is not undertaken, with the value of those sums being based on previous valuations. And that really ties in with the advance of need point, the Scottish SPPN, and, amendment, and amendments to payment schedules and milestones. It also provides template drafting to vary the JCT and NEC standard forms of contract to accommodate some of these relief measures. It also discusses the early release of retention, but with a note of caution, as, as you would expect, this might cause some employers issues if serious defects are discovered during the rectification period. It would be very interesting to see if the Scottish Government copies this further guidance and issues its own template drafting to vary the SPCC forms of contract to accommodate some of these relief measures. Next, briefly turning uh, to concession contracts, uh, the Scottish Futures Trust has now issued separate guidance again, which Vanella mentioned, aimed at NPD contracts, pub DBFM contracts, PPP and PFI contracts. There are a number of interesting features in relation to the SFT guidance. First of all, you're pleased to know that PPC contractors should consider themselves, quote, part of the public sector response to the current emergency. In SFT's view, the COVID-19 emergency is not a force majeure event or an excusing cause. This is quite a controversial view and at odds with many in the construction sector at the moment. They go on to say that services should continue with sustained facilities at operational capacity. Unitary charges should continue to be paid. Where services are reduced, there should be a temporary moratorium on related payment and performance mechanism deductions. We've seen uh, in our business a number of contract variations being proposed instructing a reduction of services to only essential and statutory maintenance. This means that planned maintenance and life cycle replacement may be suspended. <clears throat> now, there are two points to consider here. Firstly, when services are resumed, will there be a recovery plan to return the asset to the condition it should have been prior to the service reduction? The further question here is who pays for that recovery plan? And secondly, where a defect arises, during the period of suspension, and it's alleged that that's caused by reduction in maintenance 
How is that going to be dealt with contractually? Next slide. I wanted to cover some of the hot topics, um, and these are really things that have crossed our desks over the last two weeks, and give you a bit of an insight as to what the industry is thinking. We've been asked by a number of clients whether their projects are essential, and therefore exempt from the general recommendation to cease construction works and close the site. Uh, the Scottish Government's coronavirus COVID-19 construction sector guidance refers to essential sites as, quote, fundamental services that underpin daily life and ensure the country continues to function. This is further defined by identifying 13 critical national infrastructure sectors, which include energy, government, transport, health, waste and water. Related to that, we've been asked if official certificates exist that are being issued to confirm sites are essential. We're not aware of any, uh, and we've never seen uh, any certificates that have been issued from an official source, and we don't think at this point there's any statutory basis to do so. However, we have seen employers issue key worker letter exemptions, and these are designed to assist staff travelling to and from work if challenged by the police. Next slide. The next hot topic I want to discuss is, is insurance. And again, we've seen a number of inquiries regarding construction insurances. Firstly, uh, in relation to insurance, I would encourage you to read the Construction Leadership Council's advice note on temporary suspension that I referred to earlier. It has a section uh, devoted to insurance arrangements, uh, and it's a very noteworthy read. The main thing to note in relation to insurance is that the contractual obligation to insure remains throughout the period of suspension. The party who placed the policy needs to inform their insurers of the period of suspension. In terms of all risk insurance, works insurance, adequate measures to deal with the site shutdown need to be in place to avoid cover being excluded by the standard form exemptions, such as wear and tear, obsolescence, deterioration, and rust or mildew. Many projects, as you know, are covered by the Joint Fire Code. The current version of the code is in its ninth edition, October 2015, updated to take account of the CDM regulations 2015. Now, the, giant, the Joint Fire Code applies to projects with an original contract value of over 2.5 million, and a large project under the code is one with an original contract value of 20 million or more. The Fire Protection Association, who jointly issued the code, also publish a checklist which condenses the code's key requirements into a question and answer document. In any shutdown, contractors provide measures comply with the code. If insurers consider that a breach of the code has occurred, the standard form SBCC contracts allow the insurers to specify by notice the remedial measures they require to ensure compliance with the code. In addition, paragraph two of the code makes it clear that non-compliance can result in insurance ceasing to be available or simply being withdrawn, resulting in a breach of the underlying construction contract. Next slide. We've had a few inquiries about business interruption insurance. If you're lucky to have it, um, the, the first thing I would say in relation to that is that the policy needs to be scrutinised very carefully. Non-damage business interruption policies may pick up losses without physical damage, but the coverage will depend on the scope of the defined insured peril. Policies can include cover for business interruption or disruption arising from a notifiable disease. And on the 5th of March, the UK government listed COVID-19 as a notifiable disease. The precise wording, including the definition of a notifiable disease, will determine whether or not a COVID-19 related circumstance will trigger cover, or whether issues affecting third parties such as suppliers fall within the scope of that cover. Insurers generally cover diseases only to the extent specified in the policy at the time of inception. And those which are declared notifiable during the life of the policy are generally excluded. So the fact that the UK government has only recently listed COVID-19 as a notifiable disease may have no relevance to your existing policy. 
Policies may also include waiting time provisions, provisions which require the duration of the effects of the notifiable disease to last for a certain defined period before cover starts to apply. As I said at the start of the slide, any policy wording on a business interruption policy needs to be carefully scrutinised to see if it is Next slide, please, Gavin. Gavin mentioned performance security in relation to contracts and a general review of how you would uh, place those security measures in contracts being entered at the moment. Um, as you probably know, a performance bond is a form of security granted by a contractor, surety or bank, guaranteeing a sum normally equivalent to 10% of the contract sum. Bonds are usually capable of being called up or in a contractor's breach or depending on the bond wording or the contractor insolvency. Two immediate points to note in the current uh, COVID crisis. First of all, check the expiry date. Most bonds expire on the issue of the practical completion certificate or the making good defect certificate. So any suspension or delay arising from COVID-19 won't necessarily affect the expiry date but some bonds from some banks have a fixed expiry date and, and that expiry date will be ever closer if works are suspended through COVID-19. Secondly, if you make a call on the bond to recover costs arising from a contractor's insolvency and you decide to continue the works, under the SPCC suite of contracts, the final reconciliation of those costs will only occur after the works are completed by others and after the making good of defects of those works is finished. So you might have to wait a considerable period of time before the call on the bond can be utilised. If through COVID-19 the contractor fails to perform any of its obligations, you might have the ability to look toward the parent company guarantee for redress. Unlike a bond, you might be able to recover more than 10% of the contract value through a call on the parent company guarantee. But bear in mind, any underlying caps on liability that existed in the building contract uh, may apply and affect how, you, how much you can recover under the parent company guarantee. Again, as Gavin mentioned earlier, you need to carefully check notice provisions if you want to make a call on either a bond or a parent company guarantee. If a van notice requires service by special delivery, the fact that we're all in lockdown won't allow you to serve a notice by email. That ends my slides, and I'll hand you back to Fenella for the uh, question and answer session. Thanks, both James and Gavin. Um, one question that's come in during um, Gavin's talk, but I think you touched on notices at the end as well, um, James, was the question was, is it acceptable to send no notices electronically only? I, I think... Uh, Vanilla, it would depend on what it says in the contract. Um, some contracts provide for electronic service, uh, some don't. Uh, I think the general direction of travel in the standard form is that the notice either has to be hand delivered or delivered by way of a, a special delivery letter or a recorded delivery letter. So if the contract provides for electronic uh, service, yes, but check the contract. Gavin, do you, do you have anything to add on that point? No, I agree with James, and I suppose that was one of the points that I was trying to make in the presentation, which is that when you're entering into contracts here and now, you have an opportunity to make sure that they're robust in terms of leaving you with a means of service that you will always be able to comply with, and electronic being the uh, the obvious choice. I think I might stick my uh, neck out here from a litigator's point of view and say that provided you can prove that um, notice was received and that the other party did receive it, whether it's by a read receipt or delivery receipt, whatever, um, and that they did receive the notice. If you were in litigation, I suspect that it might be quite difficult in the current circumstances for the other side to, to rely on the technical non-compliance where um, proper compliance with the contract was not possible. But you know, that, that would be a matter for the courts. But I suspect if it, if it wasn't possible and they did, as a matter of fact, receive um, the notice, 
then it might be a difficult technical point to run. I think for now the practical reality is that if you cannot comply strictly with any of the existing notice requirements, you've got to do the best you can and, and yeah. run your argument at some point in the future. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Um, a question that came in for Gavin um, was, what would your top tip be in relation to contracting in the current environment? Yeah, I think, um, you know, a, a lot of businesses are under a lot of pressure. Um, including contractors, and I think um, for contractors particularly and employers is really taking a step back and giving some really careful thought to the risks uh, that exist at the moment and also bearing in mind the the uh, variance uh, that's happened over the last two weeks and we can't fully predict what the full impact of COVID-19 is going to be. So, you know, I think it's really uh, take a long hard think about the, the risks uh, that currently uh, exist and how those might develop. And I think what I've noticed, which surprised me, was that there's a big focus uh, in people considering, well, what are the impacts in terms of uh, extension of time and loss and expense, and what does my contract say about that? I think less so are people thinking about the impact of COVID-19 on the cost of uh, materials, plant, labour, etc. And that's a a different but very important issue to consider in terms of risk allocation. Okay. Um, uh, another question um, that I suspect will be on the lot of people's <clears throat> minds is where the defects, li defects liability period has ended during the shutdown. What's the contractual position for having defects rectified out with the end? of the DLP. And I, I suppose that t ties into the question of really of what, what, whether you're in breach, if you're not on site working at the moment, whether it's um, rectifying defect or whether it's progressing the site. Do you, Gavin, James, do you, either of you want to pick is, up on that? Is, is, to go first. is this question, Fenella, focused on the inability to have rectified defects or? Yeah, um, you can't do, you can't get on and do the defects now because of shutdown so that when you come back to do them, you will be late in dealing with them. I mean, I think that the, the reality is that, you know, obviously until the, the I suppose one of, one of the challenges I think that people will face, for example, is uh, where the defects liability period um, has uh, expired during the lockdown period, uh, which has prevented the employer and their advisors from attending site uh, to assess outstanding defects and issue the relevant notices. I can see that being problematic. Um, I suppose the other scenario is that uh, where contractors haven't been able to go on and rectify the defects, I suppose for contractors in that scenario, uh, it'll simply be a matter of waiting. And when they can go in and rectify the defects, it'll be at that point that they trigger uh, the release of the remaining part of the retention. But clearly, that's another uh, blow to the cash flow of contractors uh, if, um, if the release of retention is also delayed by the inability to attend site and rectify defects. Did that address the question, Fenella? It seems to me to answer it. Um, and if the questioner wants to follow it up with another question, that's I think uh, certainly in some of the contracts I've been involved in, we are recognising that uh, there's a period of suspension, so that suspends operations on site, including uh, the management of the defects uh, rectification process, and uh, we're seeking to, to formally record that uh, in a minute of variation to the contract to make sure that um, both parties' uh, rights and obligations are, are, are very clear. The come out of suspension that uh, there's not any dispute in relation to uh, the rectification of defects. Okay. Um, some questions in relation to the guidance notes that you re referred to, James. Um, do they amount to an exercise of statutory power? Um, that's a very good question. Um, it's one we've been asked uh, on a number of occasions and uh, I know a number of members of the audience have spoken to me 
uh, regarding letters they have received which purport to rely on the guidance as uh, a relevant event in the exercise of statutory power. I think our view is that it, that it doesn't it fall short of that. Um, the guidance is guidance and the uh, relevant legislation, the relevant exercise of statutory powers contained within the, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Scotland regulations. Um, which uh, really only contains, as far as construction is concerned, restrictions on movement, and um, we're all aware of uh, the number of reasonable excuses to that restriction, one of them being that uh, you can travel to and from work um, where work can't be done at home, and clearly um, whilst design development could be done at home, um, basic construction what needs to be done on site. So. Um, so far as we are concerned, when we have our employer hat on, um, we uh, are of the view that uh, the guidance is not uh, uh, the exercise of statutory power. Okay, thanks. Um, in relation to the Scottish Government's supplier relief note, are there any conditions to obtaining relief under that? Um, <clears throat> I think there is. I think the first point to note on that is that it's really the um, supplier to make the running in terms of uh, setting out uh, their proposals for any necessary relief and or variation to the contract to achieve that relief. So um, whilst the, um, the supplier relief note encourages uh, public bodies to be supportive and collaborative, um, uh, the supplier must do the running. Um, Secondly, um, it makes it very clear that the supplier cannot uh, uh, seek to obtain both COVID relief uh, alongside any other relief or relevant relief that, he, that they could get in terms of the contract. So effectively, the, 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 there ought to be no double counting. And uh, finally, um, it is a condition of that relief that the, uh, that the supplier pays its staff and its supply chain uh, from the benefit of that relief um, was described as promptly, um, but uh, the note doesn't really say what promptly means. But um, generally, I think the Scottish government's provision is that uh, supplies should be paid within 30 days. This is a follow-up question from me. Have you seen any response, or have you been asked to make any approaches to public bodies in light of the? Um, PPNs and the SPPN supply relief notes and so on. Um, yeah. Have you seen any improvement in relation to cash flow and release of payments? Um, I've seen um, in relation to concession uh, agreements uh, proposals in relation to reduction of service uh, without um, a commensurate reduction in the unit you charge. Um, an acknowledgement that. Um, there needs to be a reconciliation of asset condition after the period of suspension, and that, that in, in relation to certain elements of the asset, will be at the um, contracting authority's expense. Um, I've also seen um, a PPC contractors and suppliers just sending the SPPN to the employer entity and asking them what their proposals are in relation to that. Um, but I think that largely ignores the, the the emphasis on the note that it's a supplier who needs to set out the proposals in the first instance to try and get relief. But but, but so far, it's perhaps too early to say whether you've had any um, positive responses from public sector. In yeah, we've, we've we've had one one project where there's been a very positive collaborative approach, um, and that took cognizance of the requirement to, as a schools project to keep um, the, uh, the facilities open to accommodate vulnerable children and key uh, workers, uh, children of key workers as well. So the, uh, it, it, it's been a very um, a partnering approach to the whole process so far with respect to the one project, but um, no real responses to the um, initiative by Suppliers just sending out a copy of the note and asking what authorities going to do in relation to it. Okay, and I've got one final uh, question here, which actually leads into what we're going to talk about next week. Um, 
and it's whether you think that a failure to follow Scottish Government guidance guidance document um, on closure uh, could be a health and safety breach. Yep, happy to pick that one up, Vanilla. Uh, <coughs> it is a very interesting uh, topic um, when you look at a mix of the guidance being issued by government in Scotland and in England and the differences there, when you look at the legislation being issued and you look at the directions being given by the health and safety executive. I think in answer to the question, um, a, a failure to comply with guidance, I don't think would not automatically lead to a failure to comply with health and safety law, but I think if you look at the guidance being issued by the health and safety executive, they seem to be very focused on uh, contractors and uh, employers uh, complying with uh, guidance. And the impression you get uh, is if they don't comply with public health guidance, then it's likely that the health and safety executive will take a closer look. But that becomes very confusing when you think uh, that um, health and safety law is UK-wide, uh, whereas the guidance being issued by government in Scotland and in England is very different. So, um, you know, the, the UK contractors need to comply with the uh, UK public health guidance um, or UK and the Scottish public health guidance. It's very interesting that the health and safety executive's guide, um, statement refers to public health England guidance um, specifically. Um, so that's an interesting angle, but that is something that, that we will be picking up in more detail. Very interesting question. Yeah. Can I just add a point in relation to that, Gavin, that uh, obviously employers and contractors need to, to check in with their employers' liability and public liability insurance provisions in, in terms of how that requires uh, compliance with uh, guidance in terms of good industry practice and or not in yeah. uh, not complying with uh, current guidance, you put yourself out with uh, the cover of these uh, insurance policies. Okay, food for thought in that. Um, before we close, I'll just say next week we'll be planning to do a third webinar, um, same time, same place for most of us, I guess. Um, and we'll be bringing along next week Lynn, Lynn Gray, who's a partner in our health and safety team. So we're going to be asking Lynn for her views in case you um, breaches of health and safety regs for ongoing cycles um, because we are it, it's fascinating that the absolutely key why should it be safe to work on one site which is a critical project not safe to work on another site which is not a critical infrastructure why should it be safe in England and not in Scotland so anyway lots of interesting questions about health and safety um, so Lynn Gray will be joining us we did bill it as remobilization I think we're possibly slightly over optimistic <laughs> However, we will pick up um, on some issues regarding re remobilization next week, as well as talking about health and safety. Um, if you have any questions arising out of today's seminar, please do get in touch. We've got our email addresses and phone numbers on the screen. We've got a, a large construction team who'd be delighted to engage with you um, on your COVID queries. So please do get in touch. Um, so that really just leaves me to say thank you very much for attending our webinar. I hope you have a fabulous Easter weekend.